the Spark MLlib library is one of four libraries that is built on top of Spark Core, the general distributed computing library. I'll, I'll describe the core idea and how you can build on top of it in just two slides, and then we'll go into MLlib. So Spark is made up of Spark Core, which is the basic idea. This is the part that is not changing much anymore. We're, it's, it's fairly, fairly stable code-wise and, and API-wise. And then what's happening is that there's a large amount of growth in the libraries right now. We're building these out very quickly. And the libraries provided are, are SQL, Streaming, GraphX, and MLlib. SQL, on top of Spark, lets you run SQL queries on your distributed data sets in a, in a, in a cluster. Streaming, Spark Streaming, will let you do micro-batch. Uh, if you have a, streaming, uh, a stream of, uh, say, tweets or whatever information, uh, a ticker that is coming in, and you need to perform micro-batch operations on it every, say, half a, half a second or so, that's, that's what Spark Streaming makes easy for you. GraphX will let you take a very large graph and perform operations on it, like PageRank and um, connecting components, et cetera. And last but not least is MLlib, which is actually the most active of the four projects. And that's, of course, the machine learning library. So we're going to deep dive into that. Uh, and before that, I, I want to very quickly give you the basic idea of Spark. So how many of you are familiar with MapReduce? OK. <laughs> so MapReduce solves a lot of problems with distributed computing. It makes distributed computing easy so you don't have to deal with fault tolerance. You don't have to deal with writing a different program for every single machine that is involved in your distributed cluster. And, and it solves a whole lot of other problems, too, like shipping your computation to, uh, to where your data is. And that's just not a feature of MapReduce. It's a feature of data flow programming paradigms. And Spark, in my opinion, is, is one of the more advanced of these data flow paradigms. And, and now it's become, uh, it, people are calling it a successor to Hadoop, but I wouldn't even call it that anymore. It's, it's, its, own, it's its own thing. Um, and the basic idea that makes Spark possible is the resilient distributed data set. So you're all, you're all familiar with uh, a vector or a list in your favorite programming language, right? It's, it's, you're used to it. You, you, can, you expect any programming language that's sufficiently mature to have a library that will let you uh, put things into an, a, a container object and then lets you interact with the uh, items in the container in some way. Spark provides you a distributed container called an RDD. These containers obviously cannot provide all the functionality that a rec regular vector or a, um, or a list in a single machine programming language provides you, but they provide you mo it provides you most of the functionality you can, you can expect. Like, for example, you can take two of these vectors and, and intersect them, or you can union them, you can do map maps and reduces, and you can do maybe 50 other operations that are all listed on the, on the Spark documentation. And so because you have, and, and you stop thinking about the world in terms of maps and reduces if you have been. Uh, hopefully you haven't been. And, and so you don't have to shoehorn your algorithm into, into, into a map and reduce world or, or any other kind of world. You just have to shoehorn your algorithm into a much more general idea of I have vectors that are distributed. I need to, I need to redo my algorithm or, or I need to think of my algorithm in terms of a vector that's distributed. So this, op, this project is open sources at Apache. That's why it's not owned by Databricks. Databricks has a, has a product called Databricks Cloud that runs on top, uh, sorry, runs Spark internally uh, and, and provides a, an, an in-browser interface to Spark with a lot of nice plotting and, and visualization and collaboration notebook tools. So that's, I'm not going to go into that, but, but at least you know why, um, why Databricks cares about Spark so greatly. Most of the founders are, most of the committers and, and, and the founder of Spark are at Databricks. So the idea, this idea of having a vector that is distributed, it's of course not, that idea doesn't have anything to do with any programming language, right? So you expect to have this functionality available in several programming languages, and, and you do. Uh, we do all of our work in Scala, and then we create bindings for Java, Python, and there's a, and there's a, there's a new project that, that provides bindings for R as well. So I'll be switching back and forth between programming languages just to give you a sense of how, how, how they differ in, in the different programming languages. The key idea, after, after the fact that, after you define RDDs, the key idea that makes them possible in, 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 um, in, the, in a distributed setting is that they know how to rebuild themselves. RDDs, if 
a portion of an RDD uh, is destroyed because the machine went down. Uh, the recipe for creating the RDD is always saved somewhere, and you don't need to create. A, you don't need to care about the recipes. They're the the they're handled for you. Uh, the saving and the and making sure that they're in the right place and and making sure that they're not in the right place, but rather replicated, so that if one machine goes down, you can take it from another. RDDs know how to rebuild themselves, so they're fault tolerant, and that's that's what you expect from a distributed system. Okay, so this is this is RDDs, and I'm going to assume that I'm going to build upon them heavily from now on. So I'm going to I'm going to have this distributed data structure that knows how to rebuild itself. I won't go into any more details about how it's implemented, uh, but if it, if you have a question about RDDs, now is a good time to ask it because we'll be using them heavily now. Yes. How many failures, simultaneous failures, can RDDs uh, handle? Uh, or in, is something you can Well, in theory, if, if, if it'll slow everything down a lot, but you can, you can have almost all of your nodes go down and come back up, uh, and then you can have the, as, as long as the driver is, 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 is you, you'll basically have to restart your computation then. So uh, it's, not, it's not the case that uh, RDDs magically uh, can, can save data. They just save the recipe for the data, which means that the computation has to happen again. So it's, it's not a, there's no number on the number of failures. It's just, you know, you have to, you're gonna, the more failures there are, the more work that has to be redone. Yes? If your company has an existing Hadoop infrastructure, then with HDFS, do the RDD sit on top of HDFS, or do you have to make a copy of all the data to bring so, it into? So you can, you can create RDDs from data sitting on HDFS. So we, uh, through one line, you say, uh, create an RDD from this HDFS file, and then that's it. No, uh, well, well, no, not quite. So what happens is the, uh, an RDD is a sequence of operations um, that, again, know how to rebuild themselves. At the base, at the base of one of these uh, sequences is a pointer to an HDFS file. And then your computation will know that uh, it needs to operate on, on, on an HDFS file. And so what happens is your computation gets shipped to the HDFS nodes that are responsible for the parts of your data that they hold. And then the, the data is actually not uh, sent out or copied. It is acted upon where it is sitting. So there's tight integration with HDFS. Um, and no, there, so there, there's not a duplication of your data. OK? So let's, uh, one last question. Is it easy to, to Absolutely. It, it was, we just, yeah, Spark is designed from the ground up to be able to handle files on HDFS and other places. But HDFS, because it's fault resilient um, in a distributed setting, uh, we, we absolutely care that, that it's very easy. Yes. I'll, in fact, I'll probably have some examples. Yes. Is there a quick way to create an RDD from the HDFS at all? I believe so. I believe so. So there are there are plugins to you, you can you can get RDDs from all kinds of things. You can get it from Cassandra or from local files or from uh, I don't know SQL queries and a whole bunch of other places. It's one of the more pluggable places for Spark. Of course, yes. Okay. So those are IDDs, and uh, we're going to use them uh, like crazy and 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 very productively so. So. I'm going to give an introduction to MLlib with example invocation so you can see what kinds of things you can do out of the box and you don't have to actually build any machine learning algorithms yourself. I'm going to go over the better benefits of iteration and how they're especially useful, especially useful for, for machine learning because machine learning builds so heavily on, um, on, on optimization. And then we're going to deep dive into how the singular value decomposition is implemented into, in Spark and then also how all pair similarity is implemented in Spark. Last but not least, I'll go over uh, how you can use MLlib alongside the other libraries that I mentioned. So I guess I guess I, guess I should make sure to keep track of time because that's a lot of stuff. Um, okay, so MLlib started just a year ago, roughly a year ago, out of the AMP Lab at UC Berkeley. And since then, it's become the most popular subproject. Uh, we have more than, I believe, 60 contributors and uh, a lot of different universities, many different companies, and this is one of the most one of the most active parts of Spark, and, and it's because Spark makes it so easy to do machine learning, and you'll see why in a second. 
So it's very hard to give credit to a single person for MLlib. This is work that's been done by so many different people. There's maybe 20 different people at Berkeley who started it, and then there's maybe another three people at Databricks, and then there's hundreds, maybe, okay, not hundreds, but at least 60 people outside of both of these places that have been contributing. So it's not one person, and you can't, you can't give credit to one person, and it's, it's absolutely an open source effort. Um, so the available algorithms, there are lots. You know, most of these you're already familiar with. The, the basic linear models, nonlinear models, uh, regression, clustering, decompositions and optimizations, these are all at least there in some form, and, and they're constantly being improved upon. So improved upon usually means that they're being uh, changed so that you can scale them up in all kinds of ways. Um, and more algorithms will be added. Uh, people are adding them as we speak. You know, the, the thing that's missing uh, that I've been getting a lot of requests is our neural networks, so, so that's coming. The, and apart from that, actually, I think we have most of the algorithms that people really care about. And of course, uh, there'll be more. So let's see some examples of, of how to use MLlib. In, in here, in the first line, we're creating a, an RDD from a text file, okay? So this, is, this SC is the Spark context. It's a handle onto the cluster. It's called Spark context, and you'll see it abbreviated as SC. Uh, this is the variable name, and it's, it's, it's very common to call your Spark context that. We'll create a data RDD, that means that this is an RDD of type string. RDDs are typed, just like collections in your programming language are typed. So this is going to create an RDD of string out of every single line in this text file. And then we're going to parse that, because every single line in this text file happens to be space separated. And we're going to turn them to doubles, and then we're going to cache. What does cache do? It will take uh, your RDD and distribute it across cluster RAM, which means that if you have, say, a terabyte of RAM across your cluster, which is becoming more and more uh, common, and you happen to have a terabyte of data, you can actually uh, distribute your data such that it's in RAM across the cluster. And then obviously things will be much faster because RAM is a whole lot faster than disk. So here in, in this case, and you really want to keep it in RAM when you go over the data many, many times because uh, reading and writing from disk is, is where the bottlenecks in, in previous data flow programming languages have been. So what we're doing here is we're keeping the, the RDD in RAM across the cluster and then we say, okay, k-means on, on, on this with two clusters and, and go over the data 20 times. And then that's it, that returns the k-means model and then that's, we can say compute the cost of this or take this model and, and find the uh, associated cluster with a new point. So this is, this is k-means and, and the point is m much, of, uh, much of the invocations follow this pattern. You call, you call one line to get the model and then you use the model elsewhere. Another example is PCA. In PCA, the data will be asked to be in, in, uh, in, in a matrix form. So a row matrix is made up of uh, a matrix that, is, that has its rows chopped up. So if you wanted to represent a matrix in, in, a, in RDD world, you, you can chop it up. You can chop up the matrix in lots of different ways. You could say chop it up by rows, you could chop it up by entries, or by blocks. And in this case, it's by rows. So uh, a, a row matrix will take uh, the points that have been read in earlier. I don't want to give examples of how to read in points over and over again. And then from that, we compute the principal components, the top 20 of them. And of course, you guys, I think you guys are all familiar with PCA because I've seen talks, uh, several mentions of it. But basically, you can use these principal vectors to uh, bring down the dimensionality of your data. So let's say you have a thousand dimensional, a, a data set that is a thousand dimensions, so maybe a trillion points in each a thousand dimension, and you want to plot it. So you want to bring them down to two dimensions. Well, or, okay, in this case, it's down to 20 dimensions. Uh, so you get the principal components, the top 20 of them, and then you multiply your original data. This is your original data. And you're multiplying the original data by the principal components. And that gives you another row matrix, which is whose rows have the projected lower dimensionality version of your data. And then you can do something like, um, do, say, k-means. Oh, sorry. You can do k-means or... So if you do k-means, at this point you've done spectral clustering. If you've heard this, uh, if you've heard of that algorithm, the the alternative is you know to plot these things if you were in two dimensions. Or generally, the the the, P, the reason I see people do that do um, PCA is actually to do uh, k-means right afterwards, so that they uh, they have spectral clustering. Uh, and and there's nothing principled about using k-means here. You could use some other clustering algorithm. 
ALS is, um, uh, is another algorithm that's available. It's being used at Spotify. There'll be a bunch of talks. There were a bunch of talks by it uh, at, at Spark Summit. Yes. Alternating least squares. So uh, a matrix factorization technique that uh, the, is, is robust to missing data. So this is one of their approaches that also the Netflix prize uh, benefited from greatly. It's basically recommender systems. What happens is you have a, a, a matrix of most often users and items. Users are in rows, items are in columns, and you're trying to figure out how similar, or no, how, how, how much affinity would a user have for, a, for an item. Uh, and what happens is you want to learn k-dimensional vectors for both the users and k-dimensional vectors for the items. And then when you want to see how much a user likes an item, you take the dot product of the associated user with the associated uh, item. And then that, that product gives you, that dot product gives you a score. You use that score to find the highest ranking scores to, to, to either recommend or to see how, how much uh, love there is for that, for, for, between that user and that item. So in this case, we're reading in, uh, reading in the text file. We, we create ratings. Out of, out of the text file. So this is user's ID, item's ID, and how much they rated it. One line, call ALS. So this is saying uh, use one dimension to, to approximate the data. Go through the data 20 times and regularize the factors with 0 0.01 regularization. And then, of course, we can use these model. You can use the model that is returned to predict future affinity. That's, uh, so, so this is, these are examples, and, and I don't want to take too much time on them. There are a lot, a lot of different examples on our website. The, the Spark code itself comes with a whole lot of examples, and, and you can run these to, to see how they, how they work out. Two large classes of uh, optimization problems can, humans can solve are, are convex programs and spectral problems. And in fact, this is... It's rather unfortunate. Outside of the, these classes, um, we have trouble solving optimization programs. And what do we mean by that? I mean, you, it's, it's difficult to, so, to provably say you've solved an optimization program unless you're solving one of these two types of programs. And that's sort of difficulties with math, difficulties with NP-hardness. It's, it's just the way the world is. And so much of machine learning molds itself around these two types of programs. It's not so much that uh, machine learning dictates what kinds of optimization programs uh, they should use, but rather the other way around. Because these are the two types of optimization pr programs we can solve, much of the machine learning that you guys use calls one of these two families. And I want to go into these two families and how they're implemented in Spark. This is logistic regression implemented in Spark in, I don't know, eight lines or so. And this is probably the reason I started contributing to Spark. I've been using MapReduce and so since 2006, and I haven't contributed to any of those until Spark came along around 2011. Uh, here we have fully distributed fault-tolerant uh, logistic regression. First line simply reads in the data, caches it, so that you have distributed RAM. Second line is just generating the, f the initial guess for uh, for the weights. And by the way, the pink is Python. So this is, this is an example of Python. And then we're going to do gradient descent to optimize the logistic regression loss. So here, we, we have to take every single uh, data point and compute the, the little loss for it. And this is going to return a vector, and then, which, is a, which is the gradient at that point. And then we sum up the gradients using the summation uh, uh, operator. Uh, and then we have now the full gradient, and we subtract it from the current guess for the gradient. That's it. That's gradient descent. So these blue operations are Spark operations, which means that they're, they're provided from RDDs. And of course, if so, so this is actually being shipped off to the cluster. This data would, would have been, say, on HDFS. This, this map operation is shipping off the computation. This computation is being shipped. Uh, it is then being evaluated on every machine. Every machine will then co uh, compute, compute its own little summation, and then they'll communicate to do the full reduce, and then the full reduce will come into the driver. And that's all hidden from you, and that's how it should be. Uh, the, the result is then 
subtracted because that's what gradient descent does, and that's it. So fully distributed, uh, fault tolerant gradient descent in, in this many lines. And there's nothing, there's nothing stopping you from changing this into some other fancy update. So if you had, yeah, if you had conjugate gradient, you would, you would change this with something else. If you had uh, a different loss function, like the SVM loss, you would replace this loss function with hinge loss. If you had, you know, least squares, you would change it with something else. It's gradient descent. It's distributed gradient descent. Gra because as long as your loss function splits over your data, which means that it becomes a summation of little terms over your data, then this will work. And, and, but, but this is not that optimized. Even this is wasting a little bit of space. So what's happening is uh, the, w the current guess for the weight vector might be quite large because your model might be quite large. Like say if you have 100 million vectors, sorry, 100 million uh, dimensions that you're trying to learn, parameters. If your model is 100 million dimensions, then W is 100 million numbers. And it's being shipped off with every single single thread computation that is happening. So what if you had many cores on a single machine? Like you had 30 cores on a single machine, each core would have to get this copy? That's a waste, right? You can just have the, the current guess for the model available on, a sing, on the machine, and then all the threads can, uh, can hit the RAM of that machine uh, for, their current, for the current guess of the model. And so you can do that via Spark Broadcasting. That's a little bit advanced usage, but it ends up when you have 30 cores, you end up saving 30 times the space uh, in this case because, because of the fact that the model can be, can be very large. And yeah, so, so that's broadcasting. I can, I'm happy to answer any more questions about that later. Uh, it's slightly advanced usage, but, but you should know about it. So those are, these are convex programs. So convex programs can be optimized with uh, gradient descent. We have some other optimization, program, uh, optimization methods in there, too, like LBFGS and, um, and stochastic gradient descent. But for purposes of demonstration, this is, this is good. Page rank is an example of a spectral program that we can do. So when you do page rank, Every iteration is basically a matrix vector multiply. And many matrix vector multiplies are put together to find the top uh, eigenvector for a matrix. And that's the underlying computation of page rank. There's nothing stopping you from generalizing that in the same framework to an arbitrary matrix. And from that, you then get, say, PCA. Because PCA requires finding the top singular vectors of a, a matrix. So the example PCA that I showed you it works by, by computing an SVD. So in the case of Spark, I showed this in the, last, uh, in the last talk I gave here, so I won't go into too much detail. But basically, if you had this on MapReduce, you would have two MapReduces per iteration, one to distribute the current guess for the page rank across the neighborhood graph, and two just to take the new guess and annotate the neighborhood graph with that new guess. So two MapReduces per step. The thing is, IDDs know how to partition themselves. And so the second MapReduce of take the new guess for the page rank and annotate the graph with it is, becomes unnecessary. Because in the previous step, you just assign the machine that was responsible for the node uh, to the, for the contributions of the node. And so the new guess is already where it's supposed to be next to, it's next to the neighbors. Uh, so you can take that idea and run with it then there's nothing stopping you from, and of course, iterations uh, are also fast because we, if, as long as the data fits in, fits in memory, which is increasingly the case, cluster memory, is, which is increasingly the case, iterations become fast, and we, we need to do this for many, many times if we want to compute many singular vectors. Okay, so with these two enhancements, one is that iterations are fast, and two, that we can partition the matrix such that where a node knows which page it's responsible for. Just those two optimizations bring, brings down um, iteration time compared to page rank by almost, almost 10 times, let's say eight times. Um, so control partitioning here means that nodes, uh, pages that are of the same domain name show up on the same machine. So a machine is, is responsible for all the pages for a single domain. And because so many links between pages are bet between domains of the same, uh, so many links between uh, pages are inside the same domain because you link two pages that are, are related or subpages that are related, uh, 
that will reduce the amount of communication needed over the network because the same machine is, is responsible for, for handling links that go inside domains. And so this, this last bar is requiring domain knowledge about your graph. The red bar will work for arbitrary graphs. Like you can expect these sorts of things for arbitrary graphs. So this idea generalizes to matrix multiplication. Okay? So you can do matrix multiplication, sparse matrix multiplication, and that opens up all of numerical linear algebra. So as long as you can do uh, matrix multiplication, there's, there's, there's optimization that opens up, there's um, uh, linear algebra. So we're going to use this idea to go into uh, singular value decomposition and to see exactly how it's implemented uh, in, in Spark. So the singular value decomposition, I've seen, I saw um, uh, several people mention it earlier. So I'm guessing everyone knows what the SVD is and does. If you, can you, who knows what the SVD is? We had a morning class about 70 people on um, Excellent. Component, independent component analysis. That's perfect. So we're going to see how Spark does SVD. And, and I'm guessing, and I'm going to assume that you know what it is. So Spark actually turns the SVD into two cases. The first case is the tall and skinny matrix. Okay, so if your matrix that you're inputting is tall and skinny, and I'm not making this up, this is a, this is a technical term. The, the tall and skinny means that you have a large number of rows and you have few columns, okay? And what do I mean by few? In this case, I mean less than 1,000, okay? Which is, you know, it happens. You, you, might, have a, you might have a trillion rows and, and just 1,000 columns, and in this case, we do SVD very differently than if you had a roughly square matrix. In the other case, the, uh, the fat and short matrix is uh, it's handled in the same way as the tall and skinny is because you do the matrix transpose and then you work on that. Okay? So there's only really two cases, the tall and skinny case and the roughly square case. So in the roughly square case, uh, we, we do something and in the tall and in the, in the other, yeah, so, so two cases, we'll go over both. And you don't actually need to care about which case you're in because you just send in your matrix and there's, uh, there's logic to decide which of the two it should call. This is the logic. It's basically checking to see if n is the number of columns, k is the number of vectors you're asking for. And there are three different, well, there are really two different. These two are roughly the same. Uh, and, and, and this is the distributed one. These are the local ones. There are two variants of the local. I'll, only, I'll explain these such that they merge together, but there's further optimization in the local, in the, in the, tall and skinny case that you can ask me about later. So the tall and skinny SVD look, works like this. You have a matrix A that is M by N. Okay? So that's sort of standard notation. All matrices in the world are M by N. And then you compute A transpose A. What are the dimensions of A transpose A? It's N by N. Right? So if M is much larger than N, A transpose A is actually much smaller. Okay? And in the case that it's a thousand, say A transpose, in the case that N is a thousand, then A transpose A is a thousand by a thousand. And that's way smaller than a trillion by a thousand. So we compute A transpose A, and then it's going to be dense, but that's okay. A thousand by a thousand, I, it's a million numbers. I can handle that even on a single machine. And then there's a very nice relationship between the, the singular value decomposition of A and the singular value decomposition of A transpose A. So this is a singular value decomposition of A. You write it as U sigma V transpose. U is unitary, sigma is diagonal, V is also unitary. A transpose A, because of the fact that U and V are unitary, its SVD looks a whole lot like the SVD of A, but it's missing U, and it squares the singular va values. Okay? Sigma is a diagonal matrix, so when you raise it to a power, it just raises the powers of the diagonal entries. So we're going to compute the singular value decomposition of A transpose A. And that will get us V, and it will also get us sigma, because you can just square root the singular vectors, values that are, out of, that are coming out of A transpose A. So just these, so that's the first line gets us V, and it gets us the singular values, right? Uh, but it doesn't get us U. U is still missing. And U is actually quite large because the dimensions of U is M by K. It's a trillion by K. It's still a lot. You can't do that on a single machine. You can store V on a single machine, right? Because V is uh, N, N by K. Sigma is K by K. 
these are both small, assuming k is small. Like if you're asking for you know, 50 singular vectors, it's just fine to have these in memory on a single machine. Because we're, remember, we're in the tall and skinny case. U is not OK. You have to distribute this. Right? So how do you distribute this? Well, you know, you know V. You know sigma. You know A, because that's your data. You know how to, in, how to invert V, because it's unitary. So you can, you can put it on the other side. You can solve. And then you know how to invert sigma, too, because it's diagonal. And these are not expensive operations. This is a transpose, and this is just actual inverse, just number inverse. So you can solve for u in a distributed way by simply doing these two operations of divide by sigma and divide by v. And that's how you get u in a distributed way. So there are two distributed operations that needed to happen. One was the solve for u, and the other one was the computation of a transpose a. So to compute a transpose a, you have to, you have to do some, some maps and reduces. And uh, you do that by RDD, so you don't really think about maps and reduces. And then the other one is also the same. And we have now, I mean, we, we do this via just operations that we define on, on the matrix object. So your, the, matrix, the row matrix object has a compute gramium, uh, a compute gramium uh, matrix uh, op, uh, method. And so that gives you a transpose a. It's implemented as efficiently as possible. We do that as part of the library. And then these, this is also a matrix vector multiply. And again, that's also implemented as um, methods in row matrix. So we actually implement this algorithm not by thinking about uh, distribution anymore. We just have a distributed matrix and we act on it. OK, so that's the tall and skinny case. Any questions about the tall and skinny case? All right, so let's move on to the roughly square case. In the roughly square case, we actually do something quite I mean, it seems silly at first, but we actually use code from the 70s to compute roughly square uh, SVD. So there's this package called ARPAC, RPAC, that has been around since the 70s. It's written in Fortran 77, and it's actually immensely optimized for a single machine. And you know, we're in the distributed computing age now. We have to ditch all of our algorithms and move to distributed versions. But in this case, it's OK. OK, we can actually make do with, uh, with, with something that is very mature, very powerful. Um, sorry, not, I shouldn't say powerful, very optimized. That's the key. It's optimized. It's very optimized code. The way we, 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 uh, we distribute code from the 70s in this case is because that code only needs matrix vector multiplies to, ha to deal with the, uh, the underlying matrix. So RPAC only needs, uh, only interfaces with the matrix via matrix vector multiplies. And the matrix itself is going to be very large, right? It might be a million by a million with a trillion non zeros. However, when all you only need to do with the matrix is interact with it by matrix vector multiplies, then that's okay because a matrix vector multiply on a million by a million matrix is only a million numbers, right? So uh, we can distribute the multiplies and return the results to our pack, which is what we do. So as long as uh, an algorithm only acts on a matrix via matrix via matvex, then matrix vector multiplies, matvex, then that algorithm can be distributed, uh, at least in the case so that, so that you, can, you can handle fairly dense matrices and fairly large matrices, okay? So how did we do this? Well, J, there's a JNI interface for our pack through the netlib java package. And then anything that's available in Java is available in Scala. We write Spark in Scala, and that's it. So we, we have the matvex distributed. We return the results to RPAC, and, and then RPAC only ne actually computes this thing. So it computes Krylov subspaces, which really is a fancy, fancy way of saying I need to compute A, A transpose, A, sorry, A, A squared, A to the 3, and so on. And that's just fine. We can distribute it and, and return the results. And our pack will do its thing on a single machine because the interface to the matrix only needs matvex. Um, I would say we're bound by mostly the fact that now uh, a single dimension of the matrix has to fit in memory on a single machine. So this will work for matrices that are, say, 100 million by 100 million sparse with, say, I don't know, trillion non-zeros. Um, depend, the, whether we're network bound or compute bound, I, I don't know off the bat. 
Uh, yeah, so on, on the driver, you would like a lot of memory if you have one of your dimensions being very large. But hopefully, yeah, but, but you don't need, you, but the, 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 the matrix, the matrix which is much larger than say 100 million can, can have, can, can exploit distributed cluster RAM, which is then, uh, which is much, much more reasonable. Okay? Any questions about, yes? So you have a different system where there are different class of processes, like order control, four versus complement. Is that what you're working So you'll get stragglers if you have these really, I mean, processors are all about the same speed these days, right? Oh, the question was if you have a heterogeneous cluster where you have older processors and newer processors, uh, what kinds of, how do these behave? Well, most, most CPUs these days are about the same uh, speed, so I wouldn't worry about that. You, you might run into uh, a cluster where you have varying size RAM available on each machine. And, um, and, and in those cases, you just use the RAM that is possible. So, so an executor will run on a single machine, and in the executor, you tell it uh, to only use up the RAM that's available. So it's, it's, it's fine in that, but you'll probably get stragglers if you then dish out your work equally. Because, you know, it's a, it's a slower machine, and, and you're going to be, if you give computation to a slower machine, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take less, um, it, it's going to take more time for it to, to, to handle it. Um, what you'd like to be able to do is just give it less work in, in the first place, and I don't believe that's done right now. So, like, we don't look at the machines and say, okay, this machine is particularly weak. Let's give it a little less data. Most of the time, because clusters are very homogeneous, actually. So, it, it's, it's, less, it's been less of a problem, and actually, we haven't gotten a lot of requests to handle that. Uh, but you can handle it yourself. Like, it's, it's just not handled automatically. Any other questions? Yes. Um, I guess for some problems, it's better to go to GPU. Small data, but you can keep it all within a So, GPUs uh, like CUDA and, and will let you do some very nice uh, BLAS operations. So, for example, there's this thing called NV, uh, NV BLAS, which is NVIDIA's uh, BLAS interface. So, BLAS is basic linear algebra program, sub programs, and um, we're actually thinking about replacing some parts of. So, so we have. We, interface with BLAS whenever possible. So we, we push down to uh, regular BLAS, which is just like CPU uh, and, and CPU uh, acceleration hardware, CPU hardware acceleration when possible. And then NVIDIA and, and other, well actually I only know about NVIDIA. NVIDIA's CUDA has this replacement for BLAS called NV BLAS. You can push down to that. Uh, we have not yet. And I don't know of any cases where people have done this yet. Um, it, it will help, yeah. but. It's just not, it's, unexper it's unexperimented territory, but there's nothing stopping you from hooking together a network of, uh, of, of machines that have CUDA installed. And actually, Amazon EC2 provides machines that have, uh, that have CUDA. So it's actually a very tempting thing, and, and um, a colleague of mine in, in, at Stanford is, is, is wanting to do this. It's just, you know, it's, it's not the nicest thing in the world to have to deal with um, such low-level plugging in and plugging in of, uh, of, of of, of BLAS and, and, and network na native interfaces. That's, that's, it's just, it's, that's, that's been, that's missing. Um, Netlib Java took that, I mean, the reason I give so much credit to Netlib Java is because they've handled all the, ha all the native calls and they, they compile, uh, you know, the Fortran code into all the different uh, architectures that the JVM might run on top of and then they pick the right one to call depending on which machine you're on. So that's a lot of work, you know. Someone did that, and, and they, we, we give them credit because it's it's a very reasonable uh, thing to to release as a package. So it's nothing. There's nothing stopping you from calling CUDA. It's just not done yet because we haven't had the requests. So all pair similarity is the next thing. One uh, one last round of questions, maybe. Great. Okay. So let's say you have um, n vectors. Okay. Uh, let's say there's a vector per person in this room, and we're trying to find uh, the most similar vectors. And then by similar, I mean cosine similarity similar. So that would require, uh, if you were to do it by brute force, n choose 2, which is quadratic in n, 
uh, handshakes, or rather, n choose two cosine similarity computations, right? So this is, I don't know, say 100, 150 people, you would need 150 squared different handshakes or, um, or, or cosine similarity computations to figure, and then and you'd go through and find the most similar pairs. Uh, and that's, that's the problem we're trying to solve because this, is very, this very often happens with, say, recommender systems or uh, clustering documents via cosine similarity. This sort of thing happens all the time. So we'd like, to, we'd like to get away from having to square the number of items that there are because that's, un, that's infeasible when, say, you have 10 million items. And you can square a million because you get a trillion when you have a really good cluster. If you have a really good cluster, you can handle a trillion items in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, but say 100 trillion, that's, that which would happen when you have just 10 million items, that's, you're, getting into, you're getting into sketchy territory there. And, and, and you know, you just can't, even if you have a cluster, you, there's no free lunch. So you need to do something more clever. So what we have in Spark is that you, you can now call, as of 1.2, so this is not out yet. This is just merged in. Uh, the, it will be available in Spark 1.2 where, the, and, and the code freeze for Spark 1.2 is in a week. And then, that mean, and then there's going to be a month of QA. And then it will be shipped to the vendors like Cloudera, MapR, and um, Hortonworks and all these other wonderful companies that package Spark with their already uh, with their with their cluster installations. What he, what we do here is uh, we we provide a method in row matrix. So the same matrix that provides you SVD will also give you a method that gives you similar columns by uh, cosine similarity. And the way it does that is by a uh, by an estimation technique called called dim sum, which is dimension independent similarity computation using MapReduce. And here the MapReduce is, is in the name because it's a map and a reduce, not because it needs the MapReduce framework or, or Hadoop or anything like this. It's just the, fun, the, the idea of a map and a reduce. So in this case, when you have, uh, say, a, a million columns, you can still use a row matrix because every row will fit in memory on a single machine. A is presumably sparse, and then you'd like to find similar columns in, in A. Um, and, and that's actually done by uh, some sampling. And the sampling, what it does intuitively is instead of having everyone shake hands or instead of looking at every single pair of items, computing cosine and then continuing on, what it does is it has some pre-computation to see who could potentially be similar to each other. So if you have a threshold of, say, 40% similarity, it focuses the computations on those pairs that are, that are above 40% similar. And so the, le the less common, uh, the less similar pairs are, will contribute to less of the computation. And, and that's, that's done by sampling columns or sampling people who are going to be similar to a lot of different, uh, uh, who are going to be similar to a lot of other people with lower probability. Okay, let that sink in for a second. People who know a lot of other people are sampled with lower probability. Why? Because they're going to show up, we're going to sample them, they're going to show up so, many, so much more often, we can sample them with lower probability. So there's, more, there's less of a chance of missing them out altogether because they, they, they show up all the time. So, and then people who are very uh, uh, reclusive, I guess, and, and, sh and, and, and don't have many connections, they're, they're sampled with higher probability so that you make sure you catch whoever they're similar to. And then with that, you actually, your computation becomes uh, much more efficient. And, and of course, I'm not going to expect you to, to implement this or, 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 um, or, or, or deal with it in your code. So it's just there as a matrix uh, call. So you load up a, a row matrix, and you know, it's the same one that you could call compute SVD. SVD on or compute comp principal components on. And then the same one, you can say compute the column, the similar columns, and this will compute it with brute force. So that's the, that's the square technique that I mentioned. And if you have little data, I mean, that's actually reasonable. And you, you get perfect results then, right? Because if you want absolutely every single, um, if you want every single similarity score, you just call column similarities and that will, that will return it to you. And then if you want to scale up to a point where it's not feasible to compute all similarities, you give it a threshold. And then the computation focuses on only those pairs that are sim more similar than the threshold, and then you can scale up a little bit more.
the threshold on connectivity? Like how many other people are It's on uh, cosine similarity. So it's a number between zero and one. But how do you have a threshold on that if you're trying to reduce the computation and not compute that for all pairs? So what happens is you pass in this threshold, say it's 40%. And then only the computation only uh, spends time on, on uh, spends a significant amount of time on those pairs that are above 40% similar. So the whole thing finishes faster because the, the, the pairs that are less than 40% similar are neglected effectively. Okay, so that, those are the deep dives. So we went into, we went into a fairly deep uh, implementation details. Now we're coming back out. We'll be uh, much more... Uh, Fluffy now, <laughs> but it's still it's still worth 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 your time. So the the future work in MLlib is is uh, all over the is all over the place, and it largely is governed by how much someone needs something, so that they they either contribute it or we realize that the community really needs it, and and Databricks or or the or the Spark committers go and write it themselves. What's currently happening is LDA for for topics is. ADMM, which is alternating direction method multipliers for optimization. Uh, this is out of Stanford. The, this, it's an it's a optimization algorithm that is a little more complicated than, uh, than gradient descent, but has less communication requirement than gradient descent. So you really have the, the data just sitting in one place, and, and there's no communication other than uh, a little bit of, uh, of, of the current guess between every round. So there's this is this is so most of the work out of on Spark is out of Berkeley, unfortunately. I mean I, I I say this with a heavy heart, but it's changing. So what happens is is most of because Spark is out of Berkeley, um, a lot of the people there uh, care and, and a lot of people care, there care about distributed computing. Um, that's where most of the work on the distributed computing side of Spark happens. And then now that I'm involved, we're doing more and more on the optimization side and the things that Stanford is good at. Stanford is very good at optimization, and ADMM is actually out of S Professor Stephen Boyd's group, um, and I'm working with him right now to build out uh, ADMM and some other uh, matrix factorization and a bunch of other things on top of Spark. So, so, uh, so uh, Stanford is getting on, on this. Uh, Matei, who is the creator of Spark, is now a professor at MIT. Although he's spending his time at Databricks, he will be moving to MIT uh, eventually, and then Clearly, that will mean that you know the folks at MIT are going to start contributing if they're not already. They're pretty sure they are already. We, I just came back from a class in Maryland, uh, which was you know an introduction to Spark. I just came back you know just just this Wednesday. We're going to go to NYU to do the same. Amit Talwalker is going to be a professor. He's at Databricks. He's going to be a professor at UCLA. So you can see that academia will be starting to battle test their algorithms on top of Spark. Um, and there's a project called Spark Packages, where you submit code that is not yet ready for inclusion in core Spark, just so that you can have it out there in, in hands of a lot of people. In the same way that R has CRAN, we'll have Spark Packages, so that untested code that is perhaps a little bit academic or even not even perfect can be out there in the hands of a lot of people. And I expect academics to be using this quite a bit. Um, and of course, you guys, anyone, anyone can submit to Spark packages, and, and this will be announced uh, very soon. Uh, Shang Rei Meng at Databricks is, is working on building building that. The the point I'm making is, you know, we, we love contributions, whether it be to Spark packages, whether it be to Spark Core. There's a much much higher bar of getting stuff into Spark Core, and 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 you know, we review things to hell and back, and that's how it should be, given that it's so widely distributed. Um, uh, last but not least, I'm going to give you some examples of how to use MLlib with, other, with the other libraries of Spark. Okay? So as of Spark 1.1, which was released a couple months ago, you can now take uh, Spark streaming and build models in an online fashion. So if you have, say, uh, a classifier that where data really only matters in the past 10 minutes or so, you have a ton of data coming in, and then Data becomes irrelevant very, very quickly. I don't know, uh, 10 minutes is obviously just the example I'm giving, but you want to train very quickly and you want to have your model that is trained in the past 10 seconds available right now. Okay, so that's what you can do now with MLlib and Spark streaming. You start off a model, 
and then you start off Spark streaming, and the examples just come on in. And whenever you like, you can pick the model that is currently learned out and, and deal with it. And that's the model is being trained on the fly, so you're not going to have a delay from when you ask for the model, and you know, not, not a significant delay, just like a method call. Just the, the weights are just sitting there, ready for you to use. And so Spark streaming plays nice with um, with MLlib. We're trying to get uh, streaming k-means in as well. Hopefully, it will make it in 1.2. The PR is, is being worked on right now, but I can't promise that. But it will be certainly in 1.3. Um, decision trees is a little more difficult to. So all of the linear models you can do this with. You can do this with SVM, least squares, logistic regression, because they all can be trained with stochastic gradient descent. And stochastic gradient descent lends itself nicely to streaming algorithms. Uh, however, decision trees, they're not trained with stochastic gradient descent. Actually, decision trees are one of the few optimization algorithms. Decision trees are one of the few models that are trained with neither spectral methods nor convex programs because they are not amenable to those. Uh, so those are currently not streamed uh, because the kind of work that would be needed is to, like, say, split up a node or prune it uh, up as a new example comes in, and that sort of thing uh, is missing currently. Um, okay, so that's MLlib plus Spark streaming. MLlib plus SQL, really, I mean, the world of machine learning and the world of SQL don't overlap that much. But certainly in the case of preparing your data and then, and then running machine learning on it, they do. So in this case, what we're doing is taking a bunch of tweets, looking for their latitude and longitude, and then training uh, k-means to build a model of latitude and longitude. So this would look like it's two lines. And then out of two lines, you're probably going to get something that looks like the map of the world because latitude and longitude of tweets, people tweet all over the world. If you cluster by that, you're probably going to see just the oceans getting in the way. Um, MLlib plus GraphX, a little bit more complicated. In this case, what we have is a graph. And we'd like to use PageRank as uh, we have a graph. And per node, we have features. Okay, so. This is per node features, let's say spam or not, for every single node in the graph. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to compute page rank and tack that on as an extra feature and then run some algorithm from MLlib. Right? So in this case, we ha so let's say this is Twitter. And for each user, we have a bunch of features like you know, their last login IP and, and the number of uh, tweets they've sent in the past day. And we want to see if they're a spammer or not. So we'd like to compute page rank on top of that. The way we do it is we have the graph. This is going to call GraphX to get, the pay, to get page rank per vertex. So now we have an RDD that has got the, uh, the, the, the page rank. And then this is the features for each user that, you know, we, like I mentioned, number of tweets, et cetera. And then we join the two to, to add page rank as an extra feature. And then we call logistic regression to uh, to train with the additional page rank feature, and, and that will build us a model. So here, we're, I mean, it's very easy to, I, I feel like this is almost cheating, but I couldn't think of anything better to, to illustrate the, the interplay between uh, GraphX and MLlib. But I mean, this is the sort of thing data scientists do, right? You, you, you put together tools to create features, usually. I mean, it's, it's feature engineering is a giant part of, of data science. And this is an example of where you use the different libraries together to create a data set. Uh, the future of MLlib uh, is all over. Um, but, but one of the most important things is getting more numerical linear algebra in there so that people who want to build their own machine learning algorithms can do so with ease. And you know, the basic building block for machine learning algorithms is numerical linear algebra. So, and, and optimization comes with that. So what we have right now is we have the different ways you can chop up a matrix. The first way is a coordinate matrix, which means that every single non-zero gets its own entry in an RDD. Row matrix is the one that's most fleshed out. It has all those things like SVD and, and principal components and, and similar columns. Block matrix is something that a student of mine is working on right now, um, literally right now. You know, I'm, I'm waiting for him to send an email. The, the, the idea there is that you, you chop up your matrix into blocks of dense blocks so that then if you have matrix vector multiplies or matrix matrix multiplies, when you have two blocks, when you have, when you have block matrices, you can then uh, exploit things like class operations. Um, you're not going to, the number, the total amount of computation asymptotically isn't going to change, but it will matter drastically 
being able to operate on blocks instead of single entries just because of hardware acceleration. And then, you know, you have, you have three different matrices, and you're going to multiply them together, right? Every single pair is going to be a different uh, implementation because these are all different uh, on, on the, uh, on the back end, right? So, so multiplying a quarter matrix by a row matrix needs a new implementation. Row matrix by block matrices as well, and all three choose two pairs here. And a research goal that I want to build out is, uh, is to make it possible to, this is, this is absolutely not available right now, and it's something that is much more uh, researchy, and, and um, I, I hope to be able to do in the next, say, six months with, with students. The, the idea is you have someone who knows math, say a mechanical engineer, but who's not the world's best programmer, and they are very used to being able to optimize things in uh, MATLAB or in Mathematica with just almost, almost mathematical notation. They just put in, like, uh, I want to minimize the square of x minus y subject to x plus y being 1 and x minus y being greater than or equal to 1. This is the sort of thing an engineer wants to, be, to do. And they, they can. There are a lot of tools to do this on a single machine. CVX is an example of one. Um, and in, in fact, CVX Pi is an example of the, that. CVX runs in MATLAB. CVX Pi runs in Python. And these optimization algorithms that they run at the end of the day are, are really only going to need uh, matrix vector multipliers. So if you have a lot of data and you would like to run optimization on it, but you only want to write this form of the objective, uh, you should be able to back CVX Pi, which lets you do the parsing of these things and turning them into matvex uh, and distribute those matvex with Spark, with PySpark, the Python version of Spark. And then you, you, have, uh, you have an interface to distributed optimization for someone who doesn't know much much about computing. That's, that's a research goal. This is not, I'm not going to give you a, a, a date that this is going to be available because we're currently designing it. But this is the sort of thing that becomes possible when you have a full programming language at your disposal. Inst and, and this is actually one of the things that makes uh, Spark different from, say, Hive or Pig or whatever. These are not pr full programming languages where you have full state maintained between iterations and between computations. It's only possible now that you have a full programming language. Okay, so like I said, Spark started out in a research lab out of Berkeley, and it's now become heavily used by industry. Uh, the, the The point is that it started as a research project, and it's going to continue uh, benefiting from research across universities. And so, if you have if you have ideas or or any implementations that you think are are particularly useful for the world and need to be distributed, please consider adding them to Spark either as a package or to Spark core. Um, yeah, so, so feel free to ask me questions about that. And, and um, that's it. That's the talk. So any questions? Yes. Are there, are there any plans for things like location, sensitive hashing, or spectral hashing, or those kinds of things? So LSH, look, LSH, um, oh, is there any plan for lo locality sensitive hashing, or what was the other one? Spectral hashing. So LSH uh, is... Uh, a way to so so the the similar columns that I mentioned is, is a more is effectively actually LSH with um, with a communication uh, efficient model so LSH in some form is in there spectral hashing uh, you can probably do already given that there's the spectral the, the singular value decomposition but um, we don't have plans for uh, making it available as just a single call. It's probably just a few calls for your, by, uh, on your own to, to call a singular value decomposition and take it from there. I wouldn't expect it to be very difficult once you, have, once you just get used to calling uh, SVD. Yes, question. So ALS, have I done any complexity analysis of the algorithm ALS? So. The thing is, a ALS optimizes an objective that is uh, not convex. And for, for uh, objectives that are not convex, uh, then the mathematical theory doesn't say uh, anything about the number of iterations needed for convergence. And in fact, there isn't a guarantee that you'll converge to the uh, global optimum either. So com uh, Mathematicians and, 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 and people who go to conferences like NIPS and ICML care greatly about, and I go to these, and I care greatly about the complexity and mathematical analysis of, these, of, of algorithms like ALS. So what happens is we know that ALS doesn't have uh, local minima. It has saddle points that you can get stuck in. 
uh, we've observed that ALS doesn't, on real data, do this. And that's the best that we have. The, the other algorithms, such as um, logistic regression with gradient descent, those, those are much, much better understood. And, and, uh, uh, and there, you're actually guaranteed to converge to a global optimum. Sure, yeah. Yeah, but, but I mean, the number, of, uh, the number of iterations is the number of times all of the machines have to work together to do one iteration, and that's uh, immediately going to go into the amount of time that you have to wait. Um, so what you're, the amount of communication needed is, is really what you care about in a distributed setting that is different from what you would care about in a single machine setting. And there, yeah, we have also looked at it. Um, uh, the current version of ALS does a shuffle per iteration which means that you do a sort of the data per iteration, and that's we found to be a reasonable thing to do because we've, we've optimized sort uh, quite a bit. Yes, question. Parallel debugging. So let's say I've, I've done Hello World and Spark and Mellon, but there's two or three programs and I get stuck on something. Uh, if, when I'm running in distributed, if I want to debug it, do I just? So there are many ways. Yeah, so there, the first thing to do is to go to Spark UI. So whenever you run a Spark program, what happens is there's a console in front of you, it's spitting out stuff. One of the most important lines that you can look for is the URL of the Spark UI, which is a super slick interface that gives you timing information, it gives you information about what's currently running, how many tasks are running, how long they've, how long they've taken, and actually little code snippets of the operation that induced the run. So uh, usually it's uh, on port 4040, so what happens is if you're running locally, you just go to localhost 4040, if uh, you're running on Amazon EC2 or whatever, the look, for the look for the line that says Spark UI available at blah. And then if your code also fails, you get the exception there in a very nice way with a stack trace. And you also get to see which machine it is on. Um, and then you can also further actually look at the logs. You can also download the, the uh, standard out and standard error from, for the machine that failed there. Um, and then you also have just, just your mass driver is outputting a lot of uh, debugging information as, as it's running. So that it tells you things like, OK, I'm, just, I'm about to broadcast um, uh, a, a gigabyte of data, and then you know, okay, why am I broadcasting a gigabyte of data? It's probably okay or not. Or, or it will tell you, I am about to send the ship off a task, that, uh, which is a, which is the serialized computation, uh, and this task is of size, you know, you don't want it to be more than a few kilobytes because it's computation. Computation is just supposed to be straight up code. Sometimes you bundle data with that, but you have to be careful because if you if if your tasks are too big, um, the, just the shipping of the computation will take too long. And again. All that information is available in the console. So it's very important to make debugging distributed programs as easy as possible, and, and we've tried hard to do that. Most of the work uh, is in Spark UI. Look at Spark UI. I think you'll, uh, you'll appreciate, you appreciate it, and, and that's where most of the errors can be debugged. Question. Are there any plans to have Spark include linear programming or integer programming routines? Yes. Um, so linear programming uh, is, so, so like I said, the convex programming includes linear programming and in, uh, integer programming we probably won't, but you know, you can, there's nothing stopping you from flipping coins yourself. So once you have a linear program solver, you can uh, discretize, not discretize, you can say uh, submit the integer valued um, uh, variables as, as, as real values and then you'll get uh, some real number from which you flip coins with the bias of the return from the from the linear program. That's that's the standard way of, of dealing with them. Um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised. So there are a lot of uh, mixed integer uh, programming commercial so kits available, and they are bound by the amount of computation that you can do. The thing is, you know, it's an MP-hard problem. Uh, people sell you mixed integer programming uh, software that. Uh, that has no guarantees, but it seems to work really well. The, and I wouldn't be surprised if someone builds that on top of Spark so that you can, because they probably don't need, um, don't need much more than matrix vector multiplies too, but even other interfaces would be, would be fine. We don't have, we don't have um, a plan to add it into Spark for ourselves. I'm betting someone will. Yes. Can you speak up? Uh, Yes. So Apache Storm, is there a difference between Storm and Spark? And the, abs the, the answer is yes. So S Storm is, I mean, Storm is, is, is not 
meant uh, for a lot of the things that I showed you today. For example, it, it's not the place to do distributed machine learning. It's, um, it's certainly the place to do real-time streaming. So there's a difference between Spark streaming and Storm in that micro batch, uh, the micro batch assumption means that Spark streaming is, is suitable for streaming scenarios where a latency of, say, uh, 500 milliseconds or half a second is acceptable. Storm is for when you need less of a latency, say up to say 10, uh, 20, 30, 40 milliseconds. And even if, and if you want to go below that, um, actually no, I don't know. I, so I take back the number about Storm. I actually don't know what, what Storm's smallest latency is. Okay, um, I know that Spark's smallest latency is 500 milliseconds, so you shouldn't be look, using Spark streaming for lower than that. Um, Storm still learns on the JVM, which means that to get real real-time performance, you probably need to move away from the JVM as well. So even Storm is, is, is not truly real-time. So we've decided, you know, we're going to stick to uh, we're going to stick to micro batch, and micro batch is going to be is 500 millisecond intervals. Um, Storm is is for for slightly lower than that, and you're not going to have a library of machine learning, etc. It's just it's, it's a very um, you just have nuts and bolts with um, how you define the data going through a topology of machines. That's what Storm provides you, and that's very different from an RDD. It's just like it's apples and oranges from like a, from a use case. Uh, the 500 millisecond thing is, is a good separator. Yes. Yeah, so if you want to implement complex event processing, then what would be the technology of choice? Is it Spark or Storm? If you want to implement complicated what exactly? Complex event processing. Like say complex event processing. Well, like I said, how, how much of a latency are, do you need? Oh, okay, so is the latency is going to be that? It's going to matter. Yeah, uh, like I said, 500 millisecond. If you're okay, if, if, you're, if you're, say, doing tweets, for example, um, you know, if you want a if you want a dashboard that shows the number of tweets or hashtags about a particular thing, or if you want um, a dashboard that shows how much how many sales you've had in the past uh, few minutes or hour, or if you have a dashboard that you know somehow monitors the health of your system, um, it's probably okay to have half a second delay. It's it's absolutely. But then if you have something that is like high frequency trading, then uh, even Storm is not the right thing to use because it's too. Uh, it's it's still it's runs on the JVM and the delay there is is too much. Next question, like that, if there is some some aspect of real time learning need to be done, so is Spark the better technology than Storm? Again, depends on the latency. But if the latency you're, if latency is okay, if you're okay to learn once a second, then absolutely, because we have MLlib that learns uh, a model on the fly. Uh, from data coming in by on the fly, I mean per second, um, and then it's just a few lines to get your streaming machine learning setup going. Uh, whereas, you know, it's a it's a whole other thing with Storm. Yes. So, what are the goals of resource management? One of the goals of resource management is to use the cluster, of course. The, for batch and real time, those kind of there are many ways to run Spark on top of a cluster. You can run it with the cluster manager that uh, pretty much any, so clusters come in all kinds of forms. Right now we support a cluster manager that is, uh, we support Yarn, which is uh, I believe what Hadoop runs on top of. And, and when, you, when you install Hadoop, it, st it installs Yarn. Um, also Mesos. And then also a stand, there's a standalone Spark mode where you can just run uh, with nothing as a cluster manager, just run straight up Spark. If you run with the cluster managers, you get high availability for the master. So, you know, Spark provides fault tolerance if the workers go down. And then if you run on a cluster manager, even the master can go down. And, and if you have high availability, it's, it's okay. Um, Spark runs on pretty much any cluster. I mean, most... Um, most deployments already actually have it installed. Like if you have Cloudera 5, just go into, go into some machine and write, run Spark Shell, and it's already there. This is, this is, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing this happen more and more. People ask me, how do I install Spark? And I'm like, you sure it's not there already? Um, many uh, uh, vendors who install clusters for people just install Spark as well. And if, um, uh, yeah, so, so I, that's become less and less of an issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.